Bhavavatu Sahanao Bhunaktu Sahavirya Karavavahai Tejasvi Navadhi Tamastu Mavid Vishadahai Aum Shanti 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 Namaste. So we've been talking a lot about the Ananda Moya. The Ananda Moya Kosha is the first sheath. And it's known as Ananda because it's very blissful. So in other words, the being, the consciousness is surrounded by these five sheaths as we went over last time. The Anamaya Kosha, food sheath. The Pranamaya Kosha, energy sheath. The Manomaya Kosha, or mental sheath. The uh, Vijnanamaya Kosha, the intelligence sheath. And finally, the Anandamaya Kosha. And we'll find out later on in Vedanta Sutra that the soul merges with the Ananda Maya in sleep. This is why we need sleep, and especially deep sleep. This is what makes us happy. So everybody wants to be happy. That's why we need sleep. <laughs> so why can't we have this same happiness when we're awake? Well, we can. And that is the practice of Ananda Moya. That's what I want to share with you today. So I'm assuming here that you have uh, reviewed the section on Ananda Moya in the Vedanta Sutra playlist, and that you're familiar with all the terminology and so on. So, let's get started. First of all, everybody wants to be happy, but they're looking outside for happiness when the actual source of happiness is within themselves, in the Ananda Maya sheath. So, all you have to do, really, is to give up or uh, ignore the outer sheaths, the food, energy, mental, and intelligence sheaths. And it will naturally come to the Ananda Maya. The Upanishads say everyone breathes in and out because of this Ananda. If the Ananda is gone, then the will to live is lost. But in most people's existence, the ananda, the joy, is conditional. It's determined by outside forces, by outside conditions. This is called conditioned life, conditioned happiness. And this is why most people are miserable, because the world does not revolve around your happiness. Did you notice? Right. So, real happiness is unconditional. It's unconditioned by external factors. You can have it whenever you want. You can have as much of it as you want. That's what this practice is for. So, I'm going to give some general tips that apply to all types of meditation, and then we'll get into some specifics. First of all, you should be comfortable in a safe space. 
in a place where you won't be interrupted or interfered with, where you have privacy, where you have anonymity. You don't have to be anybody. You don't have to do anything. Your calendar is cleared for the next couple of hours. And you have privacy. So if you can create a safe space for yourself, that is half the battle right there. You may have to adjust your life in some way. And the next thing is that you should not have any pressing present time problems. You shouldn't be hungry or thirsty. You shouldn't be uncomfortable. See, like I'm sitting here in my favorite comfy chair. I've got a cup of hot tea over on the side. It's early in the morning. The birds aren't even up yet. Nobody's going to bug me. <laughs> ah. So, now, the whole point of this is to take the attention off the outer sheaths, beginning with the anamaya kosha, the food sheath, or the, the meat body. So I like to close my eyes. I like to have mantras playing in the background, as you can hear, and some incense burning make a pleasant atmosphere. So there's no anxiety, no pressing problems, nothing that will drag my attention back to somewhere I don't want it to be. So I just relax, take a deep breath or two, go inside and start to direct my attention. So first of all, I want to forget all about the anamaya kosha, the food body, the meat bag. <laughs> I want to forget all about the animal. Huh? So what's left? The energy, the mind intelligence, and so on. The antakarana, the internal organ. So energy, the energy body, Pranamaya kosha is, well, a whole bundle of possibilities. And we've gone over the Kundalini uh, yoga in the series on Sri Vidya. Kundalini is basically the energy which uh, sits in the bottom of the spine at the base of the spine, coiled up like a snake. But when we put our attention on it, it will uncoil and rise up the spinal column until it reaches the Sahasrara at the top. And there are some blockages there. Grantas, we call them, knots. The Brahma Granta, Vishnu Granta, and Rudra Granta. So what are these knots, actually? They are the perceptions of the various bodies. Excuse me. The Brahma Granta is the perception of the food body. The Vishnu Granta, which is located in the space above the heart, is the perception of the energy body and mental body. And the Rudra Granta, above the third eye, right about here, is the location of the mental and intellectual bodies, at least the apparent location. Uh, actually, they're not so much limited in space, but this is where we perceive them, where we feel their action. So the energy has to be able to flow through these different 
energy blocks or grantas. Well, what's really happening is that we have to clear or remove the perception of those bodies, of those sheaths. The Anamaya Kosha, Pranamaya Kosha, Mano, and Vijnana Maya Kosha. So this means we have to relax and let the energy rise. Encourage it, if necessary, by visualization. Now, at this point, we're going to start to hear and feel and see the effects of the Manomaya Kosha, the mind. The mind is going to present so many thoughts, see, but the principle here is neti neti, not this, not this. You know, it's just like Tinder. <laughs> you ever go on Tinder? If you like somebody, you swipe right. If you don't like, you swipe left. Well, so when the mind comes up with various thoughts and different schemes and plans and desires and so on, just swipe left. <laughs> neti neti. Huh? Get rid of all of that. Now, in the beginning, this may take some time and work until it becomes habitual, until you train your mind that when you sit down for meditation or to practice happiness, that it will automatically just, you know, shut up and crawl into a corner. <laughs> no, really, when you become situated in intelligence, you will find that the mind automatically becomes very humble because it's in the presence of a superior force, a superior power. So intelligence means to direct the attention in the way that we'd want. When we direct the attention away from all the petty thoughts of the mind, after a while, the mind just sort of gives up and goes away. Try it, you'll see. Then beyond that, you also want to set aside all your different plans and schemes and your uh, analyses of different types of knowledge and stuff like this. This meditation is very simple. So just set aside all those thoughts, all those plans and schemes, all the work of the mind and the intelligence. And you will very quickly come to the Ananda Maya. Now, the symptom of the Ananda Maya is light. You will find especially if you're in a dark room, which is recommended, a very low light, perhaps, but certainly no bright lights like I have for making videos, that when you reach the Anandamaya stage, you will find a subtle light. And what is that? Well, we've been over it several times. That is the light of the self reflected by the purified mind. When the mind becomes purified of all the spurious thoughts, memories, desires, associations, and vasanas and so on, then it becomes clear and pure like a mirror. And so it begins to reflect the light of the self. Did you ever think about dreams? Where does all the material in dreams come from? Well, it comes from our own mind. And how is it that there is light in dreams? You ever notice? There's this kind of all-pervading light, no particular source of it, but it's just sort of everything is illumined. Well, that's the light of the self. But in dreams, it is kind of scattered among all these objects. When the objects are removed by the control of the attention, then what's left is only the self. And the self reflected in the pure mind is like a sun. 
It can be brilliant, actually brighter than the sun. The sun that we perceive in waking consciousness is simply a reflection of that self. So the self itself is even brighter than that. Like 10,000 suns. It's described in Bhagavad Gita. The vision of the self, the universal self, is like 10,000 suns rising in the sky at the same time. That's what it's like. So you will also notice at this point that you're happy. You're happy for no reason at all. <laughs> so this is Ananda. Ananda is bliss. And bliss is a kind of happiness that is not due to any cause. It's simply our state of being. It's simply the way we are. At the core, all of us are Ananda. Why? Because the self is Ananda. Sat, Chit, Ananda. Being, consciousness, and bliss. This is our natural state. This is our unconditioned state of happiness. This is our birthright. And this is also the secret to attaining a high destination in the next life. That Bhagavad Gita says, Yam Yam Vapi Smaran Bhava, Tyajatante Kalevaram. Whatever we think of at the time of death, Tang Tang Evaiti Konteya, Sada Tad Bhava Bhavitaha, that state of being we shall attain in the next life. So how do you think of a high state at the time of death? Well, you have to already train yourself to set aside the physical body, the energy body, the mental body, intellectual body, and so on, and all their contents. And so this training should be a lifelong uh, endeavor that you can invoke at any time and experience the bliss of the self. And so at the time of death, you simply concentrate the mind according to your training and you attain a state of happiness. Like who cares if I'm losing the gross body? I already know how to set it aside in meditation because that's how I attain happiness. And that's how you can, too. So do this practice. This is the fruit of the study of the Ananda Maya Kosha. The Ananda Maya Kosha Dikaranam of Vedanta Sutra. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum.